we're here to have a conversation. I'm really excited. In fact, Assets was able to pull this together and host it. Uh, Peace, Electoral Justice, and the American Way, uh, which is going to be kind of a roundtable format about pro-democracy funders and accelerators and the cutting edge of what's going on right now. The discussion will explore sort of the intersection between impact investing with philanthropy and how donor advised funds and family offices along with intermediary accelerators and funders are leaning into the mix of civic tech voter turnout uh, pro-democracy funding all in this moment uh, this crazy moment and um, this critical and unique time we're in which i can't think of a scarier more interesting backdrop than the fact that we're two weeks from um, the elections to be having this conversation uh really um so it's it's kind of like we're going to be talking about fighting for democracy's soul and civil society i guess you could say and so i'm really interested to hear what these amazing folks will um will have to offer up but i, I think the the one thing i'd say is you know maybe we've waited too long to get to the sophisticated level of the conversation we're about to have uh, and the tools and the kit that are being deployed but better late than never. And also, I think we're gonna be in a war for the things that we're in a war about around these these kind of pro-democracy issues, probably forever. So better get started and get um, get kind of uh, uh, armed up with with a lot of great ideas and strategies and, um, and, and get to work than to sit there thinking it's too late and, and that kind of um, bad, bad uh, uh, relationship to the sort of sense of immediacy. So um, we're going to get started. I didn't say I'm Tim Fornlick and I'm the founder and uh, executive director of strategic development for Impact Assets. And um, Impact Assets, for those of you who don't know, is about a $1.2 billion donor advice fund, which is aggregating capital from 12 or 1300 families and little foundations, big foundations, corporations, all into a common platform that specializes in investing uh, and enabling 100% of the assets to be into impact uh, across sectors and geographies uh, all over the world. And increasingly, um, we have been sort of brought into this, this context that we're going to be talking about as our donor advisors move capital into a wide spectrum of the pro-democracy initiatives and civic tech companies and, and what have you and the kinds of things that these folks will be talking about today. So I, um, I'm i really exciting, excited to be kind of a, a I'm going to be a little bit of a quiet moderator. I think uh, Sarah and I were talking yesterday and I, I think we're going to kind of let me let the, the subject experts and actors really lead the show, but I'll kind of prompt and, and pull and mostly also try to keep a handle on um, on topics that are bubbling up on the chat since it's hard to look at two things at once. Um, but with that, let's do a, a quick lightning round of everybody on to uh, just to give us your um, your your who and your what and a little bit about the org in sort of a minute or so somewhere in there. And then um, we'll do another lightning round right after that. But first, let's do that. And maybe Sarah, we can start with you. And you're muted. Right, sorry, I, I muted myself. I feel like there's a little bit of white noise, background noise. I don't know if people want to mute when when they're not talking. Um, and welcome, Shomik, you're, you're here right on time. <laughs> um, great, well, thanks, Tim. Um, right, I'll start. So I'm the CEO and co-founder of Propel Capital. Um, our mission is to build an economy and democracy that work for all. Um, using investment, philanthropic, and political capital to do so. Um, we've been, uh, we launched about 10 years ago as one of the first donor advised funds at Impact Assets, which has been critical to our ability to deploy investment capital. And um, we've deployed about $50 million and quickly after the 2016 election created Propel Democracy which was a $5 million commitment to support innovation in the democracy space. So I'm really excited about today's conversation. And I'll hand it over to Liesl. Great, uh, so I'm Liesl Pritzker Simmons um, and uh, I'm the co-founder of Blue Haven Initiative along with my husband, Ian. Um, so we are doubly represented. We will try not to take up uh, space, um, but 
Blue Haven is a single family office. Um, we're based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and um, we look at sort of our investment portfolio, our grants, um, and our civic engagement and policy work um, holistically, or at least we try to. So um, where we want to see impact and change, um, when we think it's a market solution, we use market mechanisms. When we think it's a philanthropic issue, we use catalytic capital and grants. Um, and where we think it's a policy issue, we try and lean in electorally um, as, as well as sort of supporting policymakers. Um, across the board. So um, that takes us in lots of different directions, but um, it's exciting to be at SOCAP talking about the civic engagement piece, which is never um, really kind of sees the light of day. But I feel like in 2016, uh, a lot of people in our community were like, wait a minute, what is that stuff that Ian's been working on? Kind of sounds important now. Um, I know. So uh, with that, actually, I might hand it over to Ian if I missed anything. You're on mute, honey. Yeah, I think that's good. I would just add we, in addition to stewards of, of assets we're invest, we also bring a kind of entrepreneur mentality to starting up new initiatives and organizations. So we'll hear more about that too. Taryn, or should we? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Taryn. I'm the president of New Media Ventures. We are uh, we sit at the intersection of venture capital, impact investing, uh, philanthropy, and the progressive movement, including uh, investments across elections, movement building, and uh, inclusive and diverse media. Um, our job is to essentially to fund early stage progressive innovation. Um, I've only been at New Media Ventures since uh, late February, so it's really great to um, get to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, we are, it, it's sort of the like, the, we, sh we should be funding things several things, several years before they're impactful. Is, is, so a lot of the impact that you're seeing in this election, which I'll talk about later, is from organizations and groups that we funded several years ago, but not this year. Shomik, I think that's the next turn. You. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shomik Dada. I'm a co founder and partner at Higher Ground Labs. Uh, much like New Media Ventures, we are an uh, early stage funder and investor, somewhere between the intersection of venture capital uh, and impact funding uh, for early stage technology companies, for profit companies that support the democratic ecosystem, both democratic campaigns, causes, and nonprofits that are helping advance the progressive agenda in this country. Uh, and like Taryn, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I think a lot of the magic that we have been able to engender in close partnership with everybody on this Zoom has happened from early investments when nobody was paying attention in order to have successes now when everyone's paying attention. That's great. And then I think what we decided was that before we dive into sort of the framing and points of view and sort of the cutting edge of strategy and what's going on and the challenges, et cetera, of each of your work, uh, I wanted to hear a quick lightning round of what's your favorite or your most important or your most unique or I don't know, however you want to like pick, elevate something, investment that you've done recently, or it doesn't even have to be that recently, but you know, that, that uh, and why and sort of why it matters uh, and a little bit just a second on the structure too uh, just so that to make it really really clear that we're talking about a range of investments and to, and to give us a point of uh, kind of a window into your, your work before we dive into the real need of it um, I don't know what, who wants to go first Sarah you go first sure um, okay so the uh, investment I'm going to highlight is AB Partners, which is a digital storytelling studio um, that works with works to tell stories uh, about people who've been excluded uh, from our democracy or our economy. Um, and we were their first client, their first and largest investor. Um, and they we invested um, 18 months ago, and they now have 40 employees and 7x income. Um, uh, revenue 
uh, and they launched um, a project that actually was born here at SOCAP uh, last year. Their founder, Andre Banks, um, had this idea to fight disinformation that had been targeted towards black and brown voters in particular in 2016. And um, he and Shomik and I had lunch uh, to kick around some ideas um, here at SOCAP. I'm just thinking about like that delicious California lunch <laughs> at SOCAP and the beautiful day. I think I even went swimming in the bay at, in, the, in between sessions. Uh, it was like, like a magical 30 degrees. Day that it was cold, but it, uh, it feels and so sharp. <laughs> it feels amazing to think about now uh, that we're all stuck in our homes. But, um, but anyway, uh, there, there was a, a lot of ideas kicked around about ways of harnessing um, storytelling to target uh, infrequent voters and win black Pelante. I think my colleague Katya is going to put uh, a link in because we weren't able to, to uh, stream it effectively to show you, but they've just generated incredible content um, that is reaching millions of people this cycle. So that was a safe note. Um, and then we helped raise C3 uh, money for Win Black. And Liesl, I'll pass it to you. So, um, so I'll go, I'll go, I'll go policy side here. So this is a straight up grant um, that I'm excited about that we've been um, uh, uh, pushing at, at Blue Haven a lot, which is our support of a wealth tax. So um, sort of a Warren style wealth tax is the one we like, which is sort of two cents on a dollar um, for uh, people whose assets are worth 50 million or more. Um, so pretty, pretty high bar. Pretty, pretty high hurdle to clear. Um, but as a family that would be affected by such a tax, um, we thought um, this is a really good idea. Um, we are people, we are investors who say that we care about inequality. Um, and we say that it's something we want to address in our investment portfolio, in our philanthropic portfolio. And there are lots of really cool impact investments, and I'm definitely an evangelist of this space, but I think a wealth tax might get at it just a little bit more effectively. And so um, we have corralled a number of other people who might be affected by a wealth tax um, to uh, come out in support of it. And what's super fun about this is that um, it's actually pretty popular. Um, it, a super majority of Americans support a wealth tax, a majority of Republicans, even in incredibly deep red states like Mississippi and Texas and Kentucky. Um, it's extremely popular. It's sort of only unpopular amongst a couple of politicians and like Jamie Dimon. Um, and so we're trying to kind of combat that and get it um, sort of uh, sort of legislatively ready. And so we uh, have been working with Roosevelt Institute to um, uh, to sort of get some thought leadership around it. It's usually a wealth tax has lived within campaigns. And so how do we get it at home uh, so that we can work out some of the kinks and exactly how something like that would be implemented? Because we think it could be incredibly um, powerful regardless of uh, of what issue area you care about, whether it's, you know, universal child care or health care or um, climate change, uh, scraping just a tiny little bit off of the top, uh, I think would, would help. So that's a policy play that we care a whole lot about. Uh, I will pass it uh, to Taryn. Great. Um so I want to talk about Swing Left and Flippable. So New Media Ventures invests in both for-profits and nonprofits. Uh, so, but I chose in this case nonprofits. Uh, we made 527 investments in 2017 to both Swing Left and Flippable, which were two of the groups that uh, arose seemingly overnight out of the ashes of the 2016 election. Uh, they were brand new. We were Swing Left's uh, biggest funder in its first year, and. Uh, both of those organizations had a really big impact in the 20, uh, 2018 elections. Swing Left uh, in particular was about mobilizing volunteers to go, who did who lived in non-competitive house districts to go to competitive house districts um, to canvas or maybe do phone banking from home, but to kind of like own a competitive house district near them. And Flippable was more on the research side of tracking and researching state legislative 
uh, races across the country, which is a very, very hard data problem to like keep on top of what state legislative races are competitive. And the reason I'm giving two, which is a little bit of a cheat, is because we also then last year funded their merger. Uh, they have now merged and uh, collectively have raised tens of millions of dollars for uh, congressional and state legislative, and this year Senate, Senate, state legislative, and congressional candidates. Um, they created a new tool this year collectively called Blueprint, which used Flippable's uh, research about state legislative races. Uh, and which ones are competitive and need the most money and swing left's massive like grassroots volunteer base uh, to create a tool called blueprint that at any given point in time you can go and say these are the things i most care about redistricting and climate and it gives you a list of uh, senate and state legislative races that where your money can be most useful at that particular on that particular day You have to pass it to somebody. Okay, let's go. Ian. Sorry, show me. Oh, thanks. Um, so I should say also that uh, you know, Liesl and I have been big supporters of both New Media Ventures uh, and Higher Ground Labs, and uh, one of the reasons for that is is uh, all the exciting work they're doing now. But another reason has to do with an experience I had going back twenty years, where I was in a bus up to New Hampshire researching how we could get more young people involved in politics. Because after the 2000 election, it was clear that not enough young people had participated and had big consequences. Um, so I was curious just how people did that kind of organizing work and went on a college Democrats bus up to New Hampshire to figure out how it was going and what were the problems of engaging young people. And on the bus, I met a guy named Ben Ron and we started talking about how we use the internet to increase civic engagement. Uh, and, and out of that, um, came what you now know as Act Blue, which has uh, just in this last election cycle generated, um, channeled $3.8 billion in contributions through 100 million contributions individually from 13 million unique donors um, towards tens of thousands of candidates, party committees, and organizations. But that was, it was, it's been a long journey. You know, it, uh, I think there is a, a, what's interesting is the importance of really being really curious about barriers to civic participation. If you're interested in climate or interested in, these, in stopping wars that are unnecessary, you're interested in removing these barriers. And sometimes the organizational form can be something like uh, that is an unexpected new thing you have to invent. In this case, we thought it was going to be potentially a C3 and ended up setting it up as like a pass-through pack because focusing on the financial contributions was the most effective piece to do in a partisan way rather than more broad-based and platform for volunteers and money. So we initially started with a bigger inquiry, ended up with a targeted solution, but that ended up creating a platform that a lot of others could participate in. Um, and so the, the form of capital there was actually grant capital to kind of get it going, and that's but we set it up as a, a sustainable nonprofit. Shamit. Great. Uh, I'd love to tell you all a little bit about Mobilize America, one of the uh, most exciting investments we were able to seed at Higher Ground Labs. It turned out before Mobilize America, nobody in the Democratic Party could quite tell you everybody who had volunteered on every campaign. This was true not just across the party, but I've personally been a part of several presidential campaigns. We couldn't even tell you that answer at the end of a presidential campaign, in part because all this information was kind of balkanized across spreadsheets and clipboards in campaign offices all over the country. And so what Mobilize America did was it had a very simple proposition. They wanted to help anyone who wanted to get engaged in a campaign, understand where to go, make sure they showed up and then re-engage them again. And this simple proposition, which you could almost think of as open table for activism, was sorely needed. And when Mobilize America's founders came to us, they wanted to do this as a super PAC. We sat them down, explained the complications sometimes in the ways in which campaign finance law prevents super PACs and nonprofits from addressing the whole ecosystem. And the special place that in some cases for profits can be very uh, sort of uniquely suited to, which is to say for profit companies can engage in every kind of political entity that exists 
at the same time. They can help corporations, they can help nonprofits, they can help super PACs, and they can help individual campaigns. And that's exactly what Mobilize America did. So we were proud to be their first and largest investment investor. Uh, we, we involved ourselves at the pre-seed at a $3 million valuation, super conservative and careful, and helped them build this SaaS business from scratch, which today services over 4 million Democratic volunteers every Democratic campaign, every single one from the Biden campaign down to school board races today is likely using Mobilize America. Every congressional race, Senate race, but also all of these incredible uh, activist groups, some of which uh, you just heard from Newbie Ventures, which they are funding, is using the volunteer back end um, to help that Mobilize provides to help send people to where they can be of most effective use and re-engage them. And this simple proposition has helped accelerate the most important lifeblood of the Democratic Party, which is our people, sending our people to places where they're most needed. Today, Mobilize America does about five and a half million in annual recurring revenue and services not just the campaigns, but this growing ecosystem of nonprofits, um, which you'll hear about more, which are incredibly important to getting activism to where it needs to be. So we think the story of Mobilize America is one that we need to replicate over and again. And th thanks to places like New Media Ventures and Higher Ground Labs, I think we can do it. That's great. And and just Taryn, I know you got kicked out and then looks like came back, but you should request to come back onto video and audio because we can't see you. Um, wonderful. Okay, we're running just a couple of five minutes behind, but we're doing pretty well. Uh, Sarah. Liesl Ian, I wanted to I wanted to sort of do the framing conversation in two clumps because you all represent sort of principal funders, that being like family office types, um, and uh, and then we'll kind of extend that um, to the intermediary uh, sort of accelerator folks. Um, but if you could, I guess, just talk amongst yourselves for a few minutes, and um, and we'll watch. Which is to say, look, <laughs> what. What matters about this to you? I, I mean, I think we've already kind of set the stage a bit on that, but like, what's the what's the edge right now for you? What are the challenges? Like, what's getting keeping you up at night within the context of your work? Um, and are you uh, and how you're pushing yourself to engage? Uh, what's working the best? You know, how do you see the system? And 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 just kind of free flow that for for a few minutes, and let's see where that goes. Good luck. Sure. <laughs> Uh, Ian or Liesl, do you want to jump in? Otherwise, I can take a shot at it. <laughs> I could say a couple of quick words, perhaps. Yeah, I think go for it. In, in this space, it's been exciting to see the growth of the intermediaries like Newbie Adventures and Higher Ground Labs. It's been exciting to see the general interest in democracy from folks who were taking it for granted until, frankly, Trump got elected. Um, and I think we're at a point where history is up for grabs. You know, regardless of the election turns out, if it's Trump, will people be so cynical they go home? And if it's Biden, will their anxiety be relieved so that they also go home? And neither is good for the country. And because we need to continually invest in democracy and democratic practice for them to work. It's like the foundation of a house. Like, are we re strengthening or renewing this foundation? And if we are not, we're taking it for granted, it's going to start to crack. So hopefully out of all this uh, renewed interest in civic engagement and democratic practices, we create a ethic where we're all participating in it and democracy is not a specialty sport for those who are just showing up to vote or or specialized in philanthropy and democracy or policy or specialized in civic tech. I actually think every in uh, you know every person should be thinking about how they can do uh, their own time, their own investment dollars and their own philanthropic dollars to, to strengthen how we do this work. You know, even if it's a small portion, try to challenge yourself to do something across each of these silos to strengthen our fundamental democratic practices in addition to whatever special issue area you take on. So I think that that is sort of the questions, whether it will develop this as a sustainable ethic of renewing democratic practices across investments, philanthropy and and uh, and civics. I mean, I yeah, plus one. That that's those are my points one, two, and three here. I I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's that's what keeps me up at night. I mean, obviously, the big one that keeps me up at night is um, is that uh, Trump uh, stays in office. But um, but I think this question of uh, how do you keep this sustained level of engagement is 
is absolutely paramount. And what I'm hoping, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about, um, you know, some of the, the campaign uh, exhortations last time of just go vote um, and how we know that that is not a message that works or resonates um, except with a very small population and that we need much more um, targeted messaging. Young people need to feel like they have a stake and they're and that it's issues that matter to them, um, black and brown voters, that there was a massive uh, you know, voter suppression effort last time that was successful, and that for a lot of them who are first time voters need to be, uh, need to see that the people that they're electing are gonna make a difference in their own lives. We've supported a lot of down ballot races, district attorney races and others to help communicate, uh, you know, get people engaged at a level where they can really see the impact and that it's democracy is complex and figuring out <clears throat> how do you engage people on a range of, of issues year round, how they show up for their school board meeting, how they uh, show up uh, when there's efforts to, to keep them from voting and protest those. I think there's just uh, so many levels to this and so many ways to get involved and we just can't, can't let up after, after this is over. So, I think that's one of the most important things. And just what, what uh, to underscore what Liesl said, I mean, I really think about this, um, that everybody should have a democracy part of their portfolio. You know, I think about it, it's, it's partly what Ian was just saying, but that it's, it's an asset class, that everything we care about, regulating uh, polluters and protecting natural resources and creating a you know, fair wage or taxing people, um, who need to be taxed in order to, to make an economy that's more equitable. All of these things have major impacts uh, on all the investments that everybody here is holding. Um, and it's just some of the most important work we can do. So that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> for me, just to add to, to, to those, because I, I, I agree with, with everything that's um, that's been said so far, particularly as a family office. Um, I think that we are in a very lucky position to be able to lean in with, sure, our C3 dollars and our investment dollars um, as asset owners, but there's a lot of direct electoral work and C4 work that we can do as well. Um, and I think that I'm seeing lots of family offices that are moving into the impact investing space, but you know, the same sort of principles and ideals and values that you bring to that space are also important in your civic life as well. And silence there is almost more war deafening. Um, and so, um, and it happens all, all up and down the ticket and sideways as well, as everyone's been saying. I mean, this summer, so I think at least in the the impact investing group or like the 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 kind of the 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 private capital will solve everything kind of world 2016 was a huge wake up which was great i mean not but good it happened but anyway of of oh my gosh the government matters and we think we've been making progress but we can't do it unless sort of i'm obviously wildly simplifying here but unless we actually have a functioning democracy um, you know, with, with a U.S. brand that means something in the world. Um, and so, so that's interesting. But then this summer, particularly around all of the um, sort of racial justice moments and protests that happened and people started to really see that, oh, hang on a minute, wait, district attorneys are elected? Like we should have people, we should have greater representation at that level. Like as an impact investor, I yell about the representation of our fund managers and investment committees. Why am I not bringing that same anger or frustration into, we also, just as we want entrepreneurs and fund managers who have diverse lived experiences that make them better at problem solving. We can, it's the same thing on the electoral side as well. And so, you know, looking at who you're supporting and everything from the school board level all the way up, you know, we, it's those same principles, you're just widening the aperture of people who can actually make that kind of change. And so that's where I think, that's, that's where I get excited because it's not that different 
um, from some of the things that we, you know, that is, are happening in all these other sessions concurrently. Um, so, uh, but, but it feels a little scarier. It feels very political and it is, it should be, we are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, one of the things that, um, I always think about in this context is we tend to focus on campaign programs and outcomes, especially in the media and not on this invisible layer of infrastructure that undergirds the things we pay attention to. Uh, it, it's a great, a great example of this is, you know, Ian and Liesl helped build Act Blue, this incredibly valuable thing that is the crown jewel of our infrastructure and the envy of Republicans. When we discuss the eye-watering amounts of money that Senate races are raising right now, which is astonishing, record-breaking, all of the attention is on all this creative fundraising that's happening, but undergirding all of that is this infrastructure layer without which we wouldn't be able to raise the money in the ways we can today. And so similarly, when you read about 6 million text messages were sent or three and a half million volunteer shifts were filled, all of that requires this invisible layer of infrastructure to run really well and to have been built years ago, not months, months past. And so um, it's something that I hope funders all wake up to because I think funders to get carried, you know, we're, we're living in this world where we're kind of disintermediating levels of authority everywhere. And one of the things we need, I think, is really smart intermediary funders that can help direct capital so we don't get caught chasing shiny objects, which happens to all of us. So that, that happens to candidates. We necessarily shouldn't be overcapitalizing because they're not going to win. That happens with causes that may not necessarily be best situated. And it definitely happens with technology where sometimes a smart seeming tech, you know, entrepreneur with a lot of AI blockchain experience will pitch something and it'll sound really smart, but maybe that's not where money should go. And if we can take a sort of careful, considered view of matching capital to needs, I like to think that's a role that HGL plays very well, Propel Capital plays well, uh, New Media Ventures plays very well, and Blue Haven has been doing for years before we existed. And so um, anyway, that's that's a thing that I hope funders can help align with uh, in the next cycle. Yeah, it's like making yeah. a space I want to add systems. That. Sorry, go ahead, Taryn. Oh, sorry. Um, I want to add to that. I, I have been telling people recently, so it's much easier if you work in politics to raise money at the end of the election cycle, and it is much harder to spend it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the Senate races are never going to send an email saying, now we've raised enough money, we can't spend it anymore, you should go do something else. You're going to keep getting emails between now and election day saying that they need money. Uh, but that is actually not the best way to spend your money. Uh, if you were a totally rational being, which none of us are, to be clear, and I am not either, if you were a totally rational being and you knew you were going to spend $100,000 on politics between now and 2024, you should spend it all next year. It is much harder for the groups that are sustaining the infrastructure to raise money next year than it is later. And next year is when they need to be experimenting, building new technology, cementing institutional knowledge, uh, and and you know just trying new things. So that that is the sort of you know the HGL and New Media Ventures model is like this is this is not our big year. Uh, next year is the big year. There's really only been a few of these uh, a few presidential elections in the era of sort of social media and. Um, mobile, you know, uh, smartphones, there's, um, which have obviously fundamentally changed the landscape. So I don't want to overgeneralize, but I, what I think is sort of like the standard thing that happens to the extent that there is a standard is that this year there are a bunch of very smart, very dedicated people working on campaigns, having a bad experience with technology. And next year, some of those people are going to go start solutions. They're going to start companies or nonprofits to try and solve those problems. And they need investment next year to be able to scale up for the midterms so they can really test their product so that then in 2024, it can be like, the you know, in the foundations of campaigns at that point. So I would just really encourage people to think about, you know, giving your money two weeks before the election. You should actually at this point save it and give it early next year or middle of next year is my advice. Yeah. I, me- go ahead, Tim. I was just going to say, just reflecting, just there's there, it's it's kind of the conversation that goes on in a lot of sectors, sub segments of impact investing and philanthropy, which is, are we actually investing? Are we do we have a systems point of view? Are we investing in a systems time horizon? 
and you know, in the Heritage Institute, when they, you know, where those, those articles came out maybe last year about the 20 year yeah. advance period to get all those judges situated and how, how Machiavellian and, and, and 20 years, like we need to be thinking in decades and we need to remember the infrastructure and architecture needs of the whole system, you know, and these sub-segment systems of, of whatever we're talking about. And, and, um, and I know that we keep sort of sticking our heads up and talking about systems, like I know, Omidia, our network three years ago, it was all over the place. It was like systems is the new, you know, black, uh, is the new orange. And so, yeah, but then it's like, are people really doing that? And is there something about um, the sort of pro-democracy system or the, what we're talking about here that is even more, needs more long-termism even than many of the other pieces of say impact investing writ large, or I don't know, sustainable ag, let's say, or, you know, fill in the blank. Cause I, I that's what I was questioning. It's like, I was, I wanted to like ask each of you, do you feel that there's something even more elevated or is it really just that this is what everything needs to be approached as in well, terms of systems? Yeah. I, one thing I would, that hasn't been I mentioned can, yet is media. Uh, I think, you know, the media landscape is changing so fundamentally and so dramatically, and we've seen the effects of disinformation and the effects of social media and the fragmentation of the media market, and also the death of local media. Um, and that's something New Media Ventures really is very focused on, is we're trying to sort of find sustainable ways of providing high quality media coverage to constituencies that are not, you know, not covered by the New York Times or whatever. Uh, so one of our investments is Blabity, which is a website for black millennials. It does amazing politics and civic engagement coverage, as well as the whole gamut of news. Uh, we were the first invest, first big investor in Blabity. Run, it's run by an amazing black woman. And as probably everybody on this call is aware, like when you are um, a woman of color, black, it's much harder to raise cap early capital. So I would also just encourage people to be working really hard to pivot pivot your investments towards uh, people from underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. I was going to just mention um, one of the biggest mistakes I made um, after 2016 was quickly uh, raising a bunch of money for John Ossoff, um, who was running for Congress. Uh, in the weeks right after the election. Uh, I mean, it was like the easiest money I raised because um, people were just, you know, freaking out. Uh, and uh, it was it was just a disaster. I mean, he lost, of course, now maybe he's gonna win uh, as Senator. So that it would have been a better story last year, maybe when it wasn't so clear, but um, but never again. I mean, to Taryn's point, it was it was late money uh, he didn't have a good chance. I didn't have enough visibility into how the race was shaping up and it didn't leave uh, infrastructure behind. Um, and if I had known then what I know now, uh, to, to Taryn Shomik's point, I would absolutely be investing in the kind of unsexy infrastructure. It reminds me of, you know, investing in impact assets, PRI, you know, the, what Tim always talks about is just the plumbing. Like, I feel like that's it's so important uh, in this space. All the examples that have been given here just make money move much faster. And I would just add one more, which is um, the state-based grassroots groups, what Stacey Abrams organized when she launched the New Georgia Project that now not only has propelled her, but many other people in Georgia into political office and built power to fight voter suppression there and maybe even turn Georgia blue. Um, in Virginia, a similar state-based organization over years expanded voting rights to people who were formerly incarcerated and then now has expanded Medicare. And even with troubled and maybe mediocre Democratic governor and lieutenant governor is still really building progressive power. And in Florida, you know, a place that's always contentious, um, there are state-based groups that have been organizing and had the infrastructure that then when COVID hit, we funded them to do some COVID relief just to call people and do emergency, uh, you know, food delivery and things like that. 
and then they have ongoing relationships with people. So then when they get to having a conversation about voting, it's not the first time, it's a trusted source that's delivering that message. So just uh, absolutely the longer term investing and the infrastructure investing, that's what impact investors should be, we should be good at this. So we should be able to do this on the democracy side as well. And I would just, just add, there's a, a good one is participation. So we measure voting rates. Why not shoot for a 20 year goal of, you know, I mean, ultimately 100% participation. And so if you, if you choose an audacious goal like that and you get re relentless around the problem solving, and then you see how all these, some of these tech solutions around ballot access and making voter registration cheaper, all that up. And then you see where the market gaps are. That's one reason we double down on the, the college student voting space because you've, you've, and high school student voting because high schools and colleges can register all their students to vote who are eligible. And most of them only register half or, you know, 70% when they should be hitting 90, 95%, 100%. So that change is possible over a 20 year period. And you can, if you can win commitments from American institutions to commit to engaging all of the next generation over a 20 year period, you'll be in a different place. And these, these entrepreneurial companies, as well as nonprofits are critical in, in showing what's possible on a pilot scale and in helping reduce the friction so, hey, now it's much cheaper for colleges to register to all the students to vote. And now it's much cheaper for high schools to show all their students what's on the ballot in their city. And that's because of the companies that New Media Ventures and, and Paragraph Labs and nonprofits they support have made possible. Um, but I think it's that long, that's a goal we're interested in is that long term, like what would it mean, what would full participation look like? And then what are the organizations that will help us get there? Well, and, and also just to that too, again, to, to just reiterate, things like like youth voting, which has been a big focus of, of, of Ian's and Blue Haven for, for a while, is, you know, like any good investment, that one compounds, right? So you've got a group of people who are less likely to vote, but if you if you get them to vote early, they're more likely to vote. They're more likely to vote in primaries, which is important for agenda setting. Um, you know, when people say, hang on, why doesn't the agenda reflect anything I care about? It's probably because you didn't end up voting in a local primary. Um, and so, you know, those things really, really matter. And, and this ultimately is why, you know, Ian and I talk about this all the time of out of Blue Haven, you know, total portfolio, I think our youth voting work is our best climate change investment um, that we need because it's going to be the one that compounds and has the most leverage. Um, and so, you know, these, these things do matter, but it's, it, it, again, yeah, you have to play the long game. And then the other thing that we've also come to realize, which again, didn't sound so obvious in kind of 2008, but sounded incredibly ob obvious in 2016, is that this isn't inevitable. It doesn't just happen on its own. Um, it requires active, constant investment. Um, and you know, a lot of years it's pushing a string uphill, um, and so you have to be patient. Um, again, another term we like to use is impact investors. So maybe it's helpful to for for those listening that aren't as familiar with um, campaigns and causes to give you a sense of the fragmentation and churn that we deal with on a cycle by cycle basis. It's astonishing. The day after a campaign ends, everybody disappears. Like the, the office empties, your email address ends. And if there was a brilliant woman named Tamika who was working on a data science effort that did really well for this particular district, that, that learning is gone for the most part. This is the problem with relying on people and relying on services rather than technology. The churn is immense, not to mention the campaigns themselves end. So the staff disappear, they're gonna go become a you know lobbyist for Google, unfortunately, in most cases. Uh, the, the campaigns end, there is no institutional infrastructure and learning to extend. So when the next candidate, an up and coming woman of color with very little money wants to run for that same office, there's a bunch of stuff that was learned in the last cycle that does not get driven through to the next one. And that is an enormous deadweight loss on efficiency. Uh, it's really kind of astonishing. I've watched by law, by the way, if you build something interesting on a campaign, you cannot transfer it out. You cannot give it away. It must end. And so I watched firsthand Obama 08, Obama 12. We built and rebuilt the same exact technology. And this is on a presidential level with billions of dollars of resources. What is the school board race supposed to do? And this is where 
you know, tech and infrastructure can play this really interesting bridge to help with learnings and best practices and drive the sort of innovation, cycle in and cycle out past the sort of boom bust stuff that we deal with. One of the analogies, this may be a tortured analogy, but I was just thinking hearing everyone talk, um, the, the fight we have over fiscal policy in this, uh, it, it, between Republicans and Democrats is largely over whether you cut taxes or you invest in things like education and public health. And when you cut taxes, people spend the money and it's gone. Right. When you invest in public health and you invest in uh, education, you're building resources for years and years that will be accretive to our GDP for decades, not just for the next year. And that's kind of the similar analogy I would give to spending on television ads or digital ads. You spend it and it's gone. And by the way, we now know from the data science that you have diminishing returns in high salience elections to those ads anyway, particularly at the end. There are diminishing marginal returns. But if you invest in infrastructure, you can get, you know, gains out of that year for years from now, as we've seen from our 2017 batches of investments. So I don't know if that analogy made sense to you all, but it did to me. <laughs> Actually, I want to build on that, Shami, because one thing I think people on this call may not be particularly familiar with the union movement. Um, and because of the churn that Shami is talking about, over the long uh, run, the union movement has which runs very intense and, and, and you know, powerful political campaigns uh, has been the home for a lot of the institutional knowledge. Uh, and, you know, the AFL-CIO had a, a better data program than the Democratic Party for a, a while and before, I would say, pre-Obama years. Um, and it is one of the consequences of the decline of unions in the U.S. is that that institutional memory from cycle to cycle gets lost even more. Um, so yet another reason why we should support worker organizing is because it helps uh, build progressive infrastructure and retain it over the long run. But also a, also the decline of the union at the same time is also another reason why you should be investing in progressive infrastructure. I just want to add one point. I, yeah, absolutely. To, to what Taryn said. And, um, you know, it also goes to this idea that the more people that have a living wage, the better the economy is. I mean, it's so obvious, but it's just it just you know matters for for impact investors. I just want to add one small point to what Shamik said, which I think is really relevant to everyone on this call, is that because of campaign finance law, it's so um, much more advantageous for this knowledge and uh, infrastructure to sit either in a in a uh, you know nonprofit organizing entity or in a for-profit company, and part of the reason that we've invested in several for-profit companies in this space is because they it's so much easier for them to work across campaigns and independent expenditure efforts, and so I think it's it's really worth um, impact investors kind of digging into that model there's really a key role for you to play here because you know how for profits work you can think about different kinds of returns and uh, and that structure is really essential in this space there was a question a bit ago uh, and we, we kind of <laughs> drop, dropped into i think uh democratic uh, uh mentions a bit which is fine um but what about investments that you've seen that are really kind of by their nature very bipartisan? Uh, could you lift up a couple examples just to show that it's not it's not about I mean it's about a lot of stuff, but that too. Does anybody have any quick? Yeah. Yeah. Really was, one of our favorite. Oh, sorry. Oh, NMV was one of the first. Well, I think the first institutional investor in Vote.org, which is purely voter turnout, purely C three. Um, across the board, get people out to the polls. So that's one example. Shamik, sorry. Oh, no, yeah. we invested in a company called Ballot Ready, led by two incredible women in Chicago. We invested in 2017. This is a company that just set out to help every voter understand every candidate running for every office in every state. And as simple as that sounds, it turned out that no one had mastered that quite yet because we have 500,000 people that run for office every year. And a full one third of Democrats were leaving the down ballot blank because they just didn't want to screw up because they didn't know who the local school board member who was running. And so ballot ready is just a simple data pipe that helps people make plans to vote, understand how to vote, and understand who is going to be on the ballot. And that is an example of a, not, a bipartisan company that is just pure data infrastructure 
um, which you can trust for profit. I think the incentives align well with a for profit because they are being paid to maintain this data well. And if they don't, there's a business cost to it. And I think there's a piece of, you know, Sarah, you were talking about level of wages, which I so agree, agree with. The opportunity cost of working in politics cannot be a barrier to entry or a, a reason to leave. And that's one of the reasons I think we have high churn. And so building for profits that can be financially rewarding to really talented people who will otherwise go and take that sort of lobbying job for Google, as I joked earlier, is a really important sort of thing to keep in mind. Can Another I, question that came up. Question, uh, can I ask a question of my panelists, Tim? Is that yes, okay? Hazel. All right. Am I in trouble? Uh oh. No, no. That was, you're okay. Okay. Um, I just, I do have a question because this is one thing that Ian and I have gone like back and forth around. And I want to hear, and I know Shamik, I've, I've definitely asked this of you, but just I'd love to hear what people's thoughts are around. So, okay. So, if we talk about how campaign, fi we need campaign finance reform, we want to get money out of politics. And yet, we should be investing for profit. Like, are we expecting these companies, like, are these going to IPO? Are these all going to make us billionaires? Like, is it okay to make money off of these elections? Like, where do you, and I'm asking this really starkly. So like, what is an appropriate sort of return for these kinds of investments? What are each of you expecting? Um, and how do you sort of communicate that with your investors? Um, slash donors specifically for Shamik and Taryn. Um, Nick, do you want to go first? Please. Uh, sure, I, I can jump in. So um, it's a really good question. I think we are optimizing for the regulatory framework we have today in a Citizens United and McCain-Feingold sort of make up of a court that is 6-3 and unlikely to overturn the sort of uh, case precedent around this for some time. Within that context, I want to ensure that our companies are never rent-seeking and never monopolistic. And the ways we can do that are to ensure rich competition. We routinely fund competitors for that reason. And two, to ensure that founders are aligned with the cause and the mission and realize that they are doing this for impact and for some return. And so with that in mind, when I think about our returns framework, it's modest. It is There is no sort of power laws at work here. This is not traditional venture capital. We invest on average at a $2 million valuation on entry. And I very much view our job for our best companies of taking a company from a $2 million valuation to a 15 or $20 million exit. And if I can do that with a third of our portfolio, we will return the fund. We will be fair to our founders. And we are also exploring less dilutive forms of investment in order to ensure that founders can live like sort of lifestyle businesses. If these turn into just sort of cash flow positive freestanding businesses, I think that's a great out outcome for the ecosystem because so often we're asking investors for donations year in and year out. And if you can give them some catalytic equity capital and then have them build a freestanding business that doesn't require donations year in and year out for great services they provide com campaigns, that's a win for us too. And so we are in short order going to announce some more revenue-based financing um, schemas with our with our companies where we actually can invest and take a percentage of their MRR in years where things are great and then get off their cap table, let them run their business and not sort of drive towards these unrealistic outcomes at high valuations that I'm not sure any of us really believe. And so I, I think the conditions, again, it's the regulatory conditions that the Supreme Court's going to set and I think we should optimize for those, which over the next couple of years, I don't see changing anytime soon. And then ensuring that we don't have extractive rent seeking sort of behavior amongst companies by encouraging competition and having the right kinds of founders and hitting some doubles and triples along the way that allow us to reinvest in the ecosystem. Um, NMV has a blended capital model, which means that we're using the same pool of capital, both to make for-profit investments and nonprofit investments um, or grants. And there's really a blurry line for us. Uh, sorry, there real, I would say there isn't really a line. In some cases, we are making for-profit and we are giving, we are investing for-profit capital in a company that we think actually probably won't have a financial return, but will have a really high impact return. Um, and the reason they should be structured as a for-profit is more for the legal reasons, as um, Ian was talking about with with Act Blue. Um, 
or sorry, I mean, sorry, uh, Shamik was talking about with Mobilize and it also applies to Activate. So sometimes you want to be a nonprofit, sometimes you want to be a for-profit for le legal reasons. Um, we, you know, there are a handful of companies in our space who might have VC level returns, but that's not the expectation that we set with our donors. Um, we're really in it, you know, for the impact and like we, you know, we exits are great. We have had some great exits. We've had attentively in CrowdTangle, for instance, CrowdTangle exited to Facebook, attentively exited to Black BlackBot. So there, there is precedent, um, but I personally am here for the, the infrastructure building <laughs> um, and less for the financial return. Uh, and I, I feel like I had one other point, but now I can't remember it, so never mind. <laughs> Um, let's do a, a quick round and answer. We're, we're, we're coming up on the end of our time, but we have a few more minutes. We can go a, a little past the half hour. Um, what's keeping funders from moving more into this space? What's the number one thing? That was a question from the audience uh, a little while ago. Um, or and or you can answer any or all of these as, and, as a way of sort of tying up um, the conversation. That's one question. What's the biggest challenge to our system, what's missing? Like, what's what's the one thing if you could fix the the tectonic ingredient? You know, like what would you fix? Not like, oh, we just need some more money. Well, actually, anything you want. I won't I won't leave the witness. Um, and or what's your one call to action that's going to make the most difference for the audience? And I guess when you do that, you can say if you happen to be a blank or a blank, you know, like a foundation or a financial advisor or an entrepreneur, you know, or just a, an MBA student, you know, looking at your school loans. Um, so what's keeping funders from moving? What's the one thing the system's missing or the ingredient you wish you could major, wave a magic wand and change and or call to action? And if you need to cap, um, position it for a particular audience, that's fine or it can be for everybody. And so who wants to go first? I'm happy to jump in. Um, I think the number one detriment to more funders in the space is simply understanding that there's a new category of a way to participate in civics and politics. We are so used to supporting candidates. You can support campaigns. You can support super PACs or causes. Those are your options as people understand it in civics and politics. And really, there's a new category, which is this sort of invisible layer of technology infrastructure that quietly powers the things that I mentioned earlier, we all spend time and attention on. We notice the ads, we don't necessarily notice the ad testing infrastructure. We notice the Senate fundraising numbers, we don't appreciate the infrastructure to power that. So understanding that there's a new category of investment, it's only about eight years old. And thanks to folks like NMV who really led the way, um, we hope we can help educate folks that this exists. And on um, the thing that I would change, I think there's this general sort of uneasiness and fear of articulating your values when it comes to the sort of partisan force field. And I, my sincere hope is that people are become less afraid of it. One of the things that I'm proudest of is that we, because we're a for-profit fund, we don't have any kind of formal political registration or affiliation. We align with progressive values, but DAFs and even charity foundations should, I think, feel far more willing to engage with for-profits that are doing values-based work and articulate where your values align with that and not be afraid to jump in. It is something that I think young folks are particularly sort of inspired by. And our hope is that the sort of owners of capital and some of the older generations will sort of align behind that and not be afraid to address something that can feel sometimes spooky to be in, uh, aligned with. Yeah, I would say just to, to chime in there, I think the biggest problem is exactly this, um, just a lack of understanding. And I think um, for funders, funders on the, who fund on the nonprofit um, grassroots organizing side, I think they're spooked by for-profits, that it feels like it's ethically compromising for some of the reasons that have been discussed here. And they don't realize the value that uh, can be gained. And I think that's what you, impact investors are uniquely, we sit in that ambiguity and straddle those uh, sectors. And so it feels like this is exactly a place where there's uh, you know, room for, 
for this kind of uh, complexity comprehension uh, skill set that people, uh, impact investors on this call have. Um, and I would say what's missing is more patient capital has been, has been said here. Um, to your point, Liesl, we're not expecting um, venture capital returns on those investments, um, but we're also not expecting it to be a grant where we don't recover any of the capital. So for us, it feels like the impact uh, far outweighs um, what might be somewhat more concessionary returns. And then the call to action, um, one of my kids was saying to me, you know, this is the coldest year that we'll have for the next hundred years. Um, and I've just been thinking a lot about how we we have to be thinking so far ahead and uh, and we can't, the, the chaos, the moment to moment chaos that we're having in the midst of this uh, authoritarian regime that we're living in is causing us to all panic in the moment. But uh, to what everybody's been saying here, we have to be thinking about next year and building for the future that we want. Um, I remember the thing I was going to say earlier, which I'm going to turn into my first point <laughs> here, which is uh, the return on investment on impact is very hard to measure, as we all know, in impact investing in general, and is also especially difficult to measure, I think, when you're funding like a tech platform that will be used for campaigns that then are trying to do this thing that elect officials that then change policy in the end. Um, but the, there are st academic studies of the return on investment of lobbying. Uh, and essentially, if you are a big corporation, you spend $1 on lobbying, you will get $220 back in, in tax, uh, tax breaks. So, you know, it's not a direct comparison, but I think we can use that as a rule of thumb here. If you spend a dollar on investing in infrastructure and politics, you might get $220 in uh, spending on education or you know investments in government investments in renewable energy to, to to help mitigate climate change right so think about it from that perspective and then weighing that against the like slightly concessionary returns um is uh, seems like very 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 well worth it um if i could ma wave my magic wand i think i would try to ensure that everybody in this all of the like people with capital in this space are thinking from the mindset if if joe biden wins that it was still way too close like donald trump i would want to live in a world where donald trump could get maybe 20 percent of the vote in this country he's going to get at least 40 percent of the vote in this country that is way too close for uh, the second time around after showing his true colors as president for four years i think that is way too close for comfort and we need to, yeah, everybody needs to like have a nice vacation over the holidays this year, I think. But like, we got to come back next year rebuilding, even if Biden wins. Um, and I guess that's my call to action too. Um, I'll, I'll chime in from a slightly different angle because I agree with all the points that my panelists have made. Um, but just from from also like the investor kind of asset owner angle and for all different kinds of investors, not just family offices as well. Um, I like this sort of like, don't be afraid angle. Cause I think that's certainly like, you know, it's taken me from what I met Ian until maybe like three years ago until I really fully was like, this is really important stuff. We better be doing this like whole hog. Um, and I'm married to the guy for God's sake. So I can only imagine what it's like when you don't have this kind of conversation at the dinner table like all the time. So um, I, I feel you on the fear part, but never too late. Um, but just from an investor angle as well, like our investments are political. Like just, just as we've sort of come to terms with the idea that every investment has an impact, right? Not just the ones that you wanna kind of talk about at cocktail conversations, but all of them do. Your muni bonds do, like all of it does. Our investments are also to an extent political. There are things that they're doing and actions that they're taking and policies that they abide by and regulations that they have, or more importantly, don't have um, associated with them that make a really huge difference. And so, you know, in the same way that, I don't know, for me, my eyes were opened up when I realized that every investment I make has an impact. So instead of being afraid of that, let me be curious about it. 
the investments we make also are political. So let's just at least start by being curious. Um, and then I think you can start to see where there are gaps and problems and ask people who've been doing this for a lot longer. Um, and so that to me would be my, my kind of my, my biggest takeaway is just not to hide from that, but actually like, cool. All right. So how do, what, how do we lean into this? And I would just sort of say quickly, yeah. yeah, to underscore, we talk about impact investing means we care about impact. And ultimately, most of the solutions we are looking for around climate or racial justice or education involve policy. And that's how we scale impact for the long term, uh, in, combined with the power of the private sector often. So we have to get serious about our politics. And so given it's actually policy and politics is where we can have the biggest long term impact, what, where does it sit within our budget and our portfolio? Uh, and, my, and I think the challenge is it should be at least 1%. You know, it's not even 1% of U.S. philanthropy really focuses on democracy work. And we have to get to 1% as a country on philanthropy, and ideally 1%. Um, uh, but that means some of us are going to have to go to 10% and 50% to really get there at this moment of historic crisis of democracy, to get to even 1% as a country doing it. So I would the challenge would be set a budget. There's plenty of great projects and programs and companies out there on the nonprofit and for-profit side you know, ready to with, that are doing high-impact work. So set as high as budget as you can for the next like five years uh, for your democracy work, because there's plenty of good stuff to do. Once you set that budget, you'll, fi you'll find great things. That's great. Um, I'm gonna tie it up here with thanking you all so much for sharing us a window into your frontline work and your funding work. It's been really interesting for me personally, and I hope, and I can tell by the, the crazy stream of texts and a post on the, in the chat that it, it definitely got some juices flowing uh, in people. Um, so thank you. Uh, I, I, uh, I love the idea that, you know, this is, this is an asset class and that all investments are political too, Lisa, that last point of, of, you know, they rep a stance in the world. They have, they have a point of view that ties to politics and policy and don't be naive um, across all impact investments. This isn't just within the subsegment. Um, and I was also really struck by the uh, just that there's so much innate challenge in the four year cycle, you know, that that a lot of other segments don't need to deal with that the, the day after the campaign. Your point, um, Shamik, uh, that, you know, everything gets dis dismantled. I mean, that's crazy. If anything else worked that way, we'd be calling it the most dysfunctional, you know, system on the planet. So, you know, it's just, it, it, we really do actually need to give this some special attention on the sexy plumbing. I said it, I'm sorry. The architecture, um, uh, the long term, and, and that intersection of for profits and, and more commercial entities maybe being able to bridge that chasm of death, that four year, that this 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 bad um, bad mojo of a of a cycle, maybe that is something to really um, to really hold up and examine. And I know impact investors are doing that. So at any rate, with all of that I say thank you and uh, see you around the SoCap uh, bandwagon. <laughs>